Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Today it's Heart of Darkness, written and first published in 1899 by Joseph Conrad. The novella is often seen as a fantasiacal critique of colonialism. Conrad drew on his own adventures for the plot. The story's main narrator is Marlowe, a merchant seaman who pilots a steamship upriver in what's assumed to be the Belgian Congo, as Conrad himself did. He finds the scramble for Africa is well underway, with Europeans ruthlessly competing to make their fortunes from ivory. Marlowe's journey takes him into the interior of this mysterious, silent continent. After a dangerous passage, he finally arrives at the company's most remote trading station. It's reigned over by Kurtz, a white man who seems to become a kind of god figure to the local people. Marlowe's fascinated by him, preferring his messianic ravings to the petty treachery and mercenaries of the other white traders. On the journey back, Kurtz whispers as he dies, the horror, the horror. Conrad wrote, My task is, above all, to make you see. So did he intend this novella to provoke a discussion of the immorality and rapacity at the centre of colonialism? Was he questioning the hero's welcome, given to those famous explorers who came back from civilising Africa as they saw it? Or was he, as the Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe put it, guilty of preposterous and perverse arrogance in reducing Africa to the role of props for the break-up of worn, petty European mind. Joining me to discuss this are Robert Hampson, Professor of Modern Literature at Royal Holloway University of London, Lawrence Davis, Honorary Senior Research Fellow in English at Glasgow University, and Visiting Professor of Comparative Literature at Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, and Susan Jones, Fellow and Tutor in English at St Hilda's College, Oxford. Susan Jones, can we just briskly talk a little about Conrad's early life? What do we know about him? Well, we know that he was born in the Ukraine and um, it was the part of the Ukraine that was mainly occupied by Polish landowners. Um, He was born into an extraordinarily complex political situation. Um, His parents were both literary people. His father, Apollo Korzeniowski, was a writer and playwright, and he he did many translations, including those of Shakespeare and Dickens. So Conrad's first uh, um, experience of reading Shakespeare and Dickens of English literature would have been through his father's translations. His parents were also involved in political activity. Um, they his his father moved to War- Warsaw to join an underground um, group that um, was hoping to revolt against the Russian hegemony at that time in 1850, um, in the 1860s. Um, And he um, was, in fact, arrested before the 1863 insurrection. His mother was also arrested, and the whole family was exiled to northern Russia, to Vologda, northeast of Moscow, um, where they all suffered tremendous privation. In fact, um, his mother never really recovered her health from this exile, and she died in 1865 when Conrad was only seven years old. His father died when he was 11. So his his early life is really coloured by this... Um, this whole um, register of a kind of elegiac lamentation we have in Conrad's memories of his father um, sitting on the anniversary of his mother's death with her portrait in a room by himself, not speaking and not eating. That kind of um, elegiac uh, register is, is very prevalent in his... Uh, in his later memories. Of, and as you of say, his... it, was, it was infused with literature, the house. Uh, it was also had, uh, came from an so, a, a aristocratic Polish family, but it was settled in the Ukraine, so yes. the dislocation already there. Uh, his father's extraordinarily famous. The, at his funeral, we are told thousands, some people say 10,000 people attended his father's funeral, led, and Conrad, the boy, this little 11-year-old boy, had to walk in front at this, uh, an image and you know, a fact that, uh, unsurprisingly, he yes. never forgot. Um, 
And, and that's a very powerful background, the revolutionary side. And then uh, at about 16 or 17, he, as it were, ran away to sea, yes. went to Marseille, and uh, embarked on what became uh, a quite successful uh, career as a, a seaman. Can you, again, brief, briefly take... Why did he go and... and uh, well, one of, the, one of the reasons I think that he probably went was that if he had stayed in Russia, he would have been con- uh, in, in Poland, he would have been conscripted into the Russian army. I mean, that's a possible reason. He also had a very romantic idea of the sea. And you have to remember that he was absolutely infused with, with Polish romantic literature, that he, um, his, his parents had both you know, given him this, this idea of uh, the 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 idealism of the Polish Romantic uh, national um, state. Uh, but he moved away from that because, because of uh, his obvious trauma in, in losing his parents. He did actually um, first see the sea with his uncle, Tadeusz Bobrowski, that's his mother's uncle, uh, at Odessa. And he, uh, after that, he, he read a lot of... Um, literature such as Jules Verne and travel writing. And he had this, this notion that he wanted to go to sea. But when, uh, we, uh, finally, before, before we move on about the sea, he, we are told that when he went to Marseille, was it, first of all, the, the, there's gun running involved with this young yes. boy, there's <laughs> yes, losing indeed. money in Monte Carlo, how much money you've got to lose as an 18-year-old um, <laughs> well, kid. All... No, it doesn't matter, but still, he lost money. In, yeah. um, that there's almost the suspicion of an attempted suicide attempt. Right, there's, yes. there's, there's, there's quite a lot going on there. But then he buckles down and, and, and just to, to, to cut to the chase, he becomes a very good seaman. Uh, he goes into the British Merchant Navy. He ends up a uh, first mate and then captain on, on, on extremely uh, adequate, more than adequate ships. So he really knows what he's up about and he travels all over the world. He travels all over the world. He goes to Australia. He goes to the Far East. He, um, he goes to Mauritius, Singapore, Bangkok. Um, and he, um, you know, he, he actually only becomes uh, master of one ship, the Otago, which he, he actually only takes that post for three months, so he, he never quite did, uh, uh, he, he didn't really fulfill his um, potential as a master or seaman. However, he did um, realise, I think, quite early on that um, as sail was giving way to steamships, that uh, the employment was going to run out, and he began to think about alternative forms of employment. And not on, not not on, unexpectedly, given his background, Robert Hampson, he began to think of writing. Why do you think he wrote in English? It was his third language or his fourth language. Which which well, what was it in the pecking order? There was Polish, there was Russian. Well, there was Polish and French, which he was Polish brought up French, with as a yes. as a Polish aristocrat. And there's a very early letter that he writes to his father, which is written in French to his father, at about the age of three. It's only about three, it's about six words, but it's in French. And then at school he would have learned, uh, well, he would have learned German and he would have learned Russian because of the partition of Poland. And he probably learned some Latin at school as well. He's certainly familiar with Latin, enough Latin tags in his fiction, Morituri, um, Nos Morituri Te Salutant, for example, in Heart of Darkness. Yes. And then he starts learning... Salute ra- those who are going to die. Exactly. The gladiators yes. say to the Caesar of the moment in the arena, salute us who are going to die. Uh, we yeah. salute you, right. That's yes. right, yeah. that's right. Um, and, anyway. and then he learns English when he's uh, um, in the Merchant Navy. So we've got Polish and we've got French, yeah. at least. Uh, but why did he decide to write in English? In personal record, he claims that he was adopted by the genius of the language, that it wasn't a decision, it was already determined for him. Um, but against that kind of self-mythologizing, that when Almer's Folly, his first novel, was being considered for publication by Fisher Unwin, he was also discussing with Marguerite Porodowska the possibility of collaborating on another version of it in French uh, for Rive de Damond. So it was probably touch and go at that point. Yeah. But what was the touch then? Why did he... I mean, you're, you are three <laughs> supreme Conrad scholars, so what we, what we want to know is the business. Why did he decide, thank goodness, yes. uh, to write in the language which, we, which I'm attempting to speak, <laughs> rather than in, in the French that I learned at school. And why did he do that? Or even in Polish? I assume he was writing in English because he was on board English ships at, at mm. that point. And certainly that um, he was carrying the manuscript of Almer's Folly with him on those, on those voyages. Can we uh, talk about Heart of Darkness, uh, speak, move towards that now? Um, can you just give us some context? Uh, it was written in the 
1890s. It was published first in, let's call it serial form in 1899, properly published in <coughs> 1902. But what's going on in the 1880s, 1890s that, that just gives us a context? And maybe we can refer to two things. You can tell us about the Berlin Conference and King Leopold of Belgium. So if we start right. with the Berlin okay. Conference. Um, the Berlin Conference is 1884-85. It's called by Bismarck. Um, and it's set up originally by the French and the Germans as a way of controlling and cutting into British um, possessions in Africa. But when the conference takes place, uh, the, the attend people at the conference are uh, France, Germany, Holland, Port, uh, Portugal, and so on. The, the main um, stakeholders were in the colonization of Africa. But uh, once the conference starts, Bismarck actually backs Leopold of Belgium, who's not there. And um, what he backs is Leopold. At the end of the conference, the, the, um, the main person to gain from it is Leopold, who gets... Uh, the Congo. The, the conference is set up with three aims, explicit aims. One is to uh, free trade on on the Congo, to free navigation on the Niger, and to um, set the procedures for the annexation of further properties and further possessions in Africa. There's a re-energising of colonialism there, isn't there? Yeah. Can you, yeah. again, just give us the nub right. of that? Yeah. In Well, to go back, in the 1870s, um, Africa, as heart of darkness implies, was still, as far as Europe was concerned, a blank map. It hadn't been, the interior hadn't really been we charted. We called it a blank map to be certain persons <laughs> reaching for their telephone. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I, as the, as the, as the as heart of said, darkness. Out says. of the mouths of academics <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> as, far as, the, as far as Europeans were concerned, and as far as European mapping was yes. concerned. By 1884 85, when the conference takes place, um, the scramble for Africa is, pretty, has, has, is well underway that um, France, Germany, uh, Holland, Britain, and so on, have, ta- have annexed or have formal or informal empires already in process. Um, there's a big push towards that then with, um, on the one hand in Britain with Lord Salisbury and the policy of um, from Cape to Cairo and from Niger to Nile. Uh, so there's a, there's a large kind of territorial ambition there in Britain. Uh, the other, a lot, really, that's, if you think of it. That's a lot of Africa. Yes. Yeah. And the other, the other driver is Leopold and um, what Leopold is doing in Belgium. Let's just mention King Leopold of Belgium for a moment. He had he, he had what was virtually a private empire, didn't yes, he? Indeed. In what we let's call it Belgian Congo. Yeah. That's yeah. fair enough for the purposes of this conversation. Can you give us some idea of what that meant, a private empire, and how he ran it? Right, because that um, is central to this book. Yes, um, Leopold had been very impressed by a book by Jay Money called um, Java or How to Manage a Colony, and he was impressed by two things in that. One was that. Um, it described how a colony that was run by a private company where the principal shareholder was the Dutch king, which obviously appealed to Leopold as a model. And secondly, it was a method of working a colony through forced labour. And he saw ways in which that then reduced your costs if you, did, if you enslaved your workforce rather than paying them. It was obviously much better for your balance. Uh, so that inspired him to want, to want a colony. And he originally put in an offer to Spain for uh, the Philippines, which was turned down, that, um, and they, they subsequently lost it to America. And then he um, moved into the Congo. And he moved into the Congo, th- partly he set himself up as a philanthropist and set up the um, African Association, which was a kind of philanthropic organisation. And then um, he also set up the Association for the Congo, which was a private company. But it became noted for its intense brutality. It's yes, uh, crim- yeah. calling people criminals but using them as slaves yeah, yeah. and so on. So yeah. we've got that there. Now, just another in place before we come to the book, Lawrence Davis. This was a time of Livingstone and Stanley, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, and Conrad, as I understand it, was impressed by and influenced by what Livingstone uh, was attempting to do or had done in Africa. Yes. <laughs> Conrad makes quite a distinction in the course of the book, as we'll see in a moment, between different ways of colonial work, exploitation, however you want to put it. He was very much struck by the enormous publicity given to the Stanley expedition, but there was also great controversy about the conduct of Stanley's column, the way they behaved on their drive south to find Livingston. So you have that contrast set up. Uh, Stanley had a pretty sinister reputation for cruelty. So we have, from the, even from Conrad's taking on people whom he admired, because he always mm-hmm. gave the British Empire the edge right. and British mm-hmm. Anglo-speaking, mm-hmm. Anglo-American-speaking mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. edge in this. Right. He's still saying, yes, that they, might, they might say high ideals, but, but there's, there's, there's dirty work going on in the... Yes, there's a distinction yeah. to be made there, I think, for Conrad, between people like Livingston and people like Stanley, who, a very enterprising and ruthless man, was 
also creating something like a vast publicity campaign backed by newspapers in the United States, creating this figure of the noble Stanley, the great hero. There was a similar process going on with Cecil Rhodes. And so there's some ambivalence in Britain about this. There's some ambivalence in Europe about this. But certainly there's the idea out there that the missionaries at least are emissaries of light as the... Uh, as the aunt would say in well, there's a certain sense isn't it because Conrad himself says after being uh, going uh, uh, in, into the Congo I was a brute before yes. that before That's I went right. there and then yes. uh, presumably came back not a brute and so there's a sense in which you're you're civilised or cauterised in this cauldron as well like, can yes. you be cauterised in a cauldron I think we'll just have to let that pass but, I, <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, can we just can you just refer to that for a moment certainly yes I, th- I think the Congo made Conrad come alive in some ways morally, if you like. It made him think through a lot of his assumptions about what civilization was, what people actually meant when they said certain things, the huge gap sometimes between high, lofty talk and actual deeds. There's also a great difference between what's being said in the mother country, the metro- the metro- in the metropolis, and what's being done. And just finally, and this is the last question before we're on the book itself, there was a lot of literature about, let's say, the empire, the colonies, yes. mm-hmm. in, uh, in daring do what we would now call yeah. boys' own, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. white Brits triumph mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. style. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, very popular. Yep. Um, Captain Marriott, Dwight Haggard, mm-hmm. and so on, and mm-hmm. in different ways, Kipling and so on. So, How did Conrad, as it were, take that on, or did he feel he was taking it on? Did he feel he was part of it, against it, and so on? He doesn't doesn't talk about it explicitly. We know that he read a lot of... He read a lot of Marriott, he read a lot of Captain Main Reed, who was very popular in the 50s and 60s. But what he does in Heart of Darkness is very different from that. He breaks a lot of the rules. There's a lot of sensational magazine fiction at the time, which talks a lot about which doc quotation marks, which, which doctors, juju, and so on and so on. It's very sensational stuff. And if you take any of the 1890s magazines, The Strand, for example, or Chapman's, there's lots and lots of that kind of fiction there. Some of it's set in Malaysia, for example, but much of it's set in Africa. Then you've got the romantic kind, the Haggard kind, where you've got... Uh, journeys into the interior where there's a marvel to be found, a wonderful country, a lost race, empresses, she who must be obeyed, all kinds of possibilities. And again, you don't quite find that in Heart of Darkness. Right, Heart of Darkness, Robert Hampson. This is novella. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's considered to be a great book, mm-hmm. and it's uh, um, been studied by people like yourselves almost since it came out uh, and read massively. Where... Can you just tell listeners, briefly, I outlined the story, Man Goes of Congo, at the end, this man called Kurtz, uh, supposed to be a great civilised figure, has become a god-stroke devil figure and so on. The story is very straightforward. Given what Lawrence has said, what, what would be the difference when people received Heart of Darkness to what they'd been getting mm-hmm. in terms of novels or anything, really, right. about the colonial experience? Right. Um, I think one difference would, would be, as Lawrence was suggesting, that th- this isn't a story of triumph. And it's not a story of the Europeans triumphing in, in, in this case, in Africa, uh, which is similar to what Conrad had done in some of his earlier fictions in Malaysia, that, that one of the unsettling things was that they, these were not stories about the triumphant white man. Um, w- on the other hand, what it does play into and is um, there another narrative which appears later, which is the narrative of the the white man who degenerates in the tropics and or goes native. There's another kind of narrative, though, which was a later version and reflected anxieties about what happens to Europeans when they um, get too close to other cultures. Do you think there's a tension between what he found when he himself went up there, because he kept notebooks, yeah, he made yeah, observations, yeah. and he went there, yeah. and although he never liked to say it was the Belgian Congo and yeah. got very yeah. upset when somebody said, look, it really is, yeah. um, he said it was just a place, <laughs> a river that led yeah. into sort of yeah. west of Africa and went deep yeah. into the... Um, that'll do, well, which yeah. is fair enough. Mm. It's his fiction. He can, he, can, he can nominate what his fiction yeah. is. That's yeah. his right yeah. as a fiction writer. Yeah. Um, but was the was there this... Did he himself feel this tension? I mean, that remark mm. struck me very much reading for this program. I was a brute before mm. I went there. Yeah. It's yeah. a big thing for, to say, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, he doesn't. He never said anything lightly. So, yeah. Well, I think what what he experienced in the Congo was something he could not possibly have foreseen. 
I think, um, the, just the sheer horror of what was being done to the Africans by the, by the um, for, by Leopold's forces in the Congo was was devastating for him. And also what he saw of the Europeans around him, which comes across in uh, the people in, this, in the central station, the kind of values they're living by, I think. Lawrence, I'll, be, I'll go back to you one, one moment. But Lawrence, he, he writes a story within a story. Mm-hmm. We meet Marlowe, yes. uh, and we met before. Anyway, meet Marlowe, the seaman, mm-hmm. uh, who has this, looks after this little boat, the captain right. first met, and then he tells the story. Uh, and more or less, 95% of the time, so, but now and then he breaks off and the, uh, and, and the uh, narrator comes in and said, well, Marlowe looked up and at the stars and I realise most people just telling the story till we're asleep uh, and that sort of thing. But it goes in that way. Yes. Now, what's the adva- why did you do that? Why, what's the advantage of that for Conrad? Well, it's a very traditional means of framing a story used very untraditionally. For a start, as the outer narrator says, Marlowe's stories are very strange. They're not like Seaman's yarns. You can't just crack open the nut and see the story. Marlowe's very tentative in many ways. He's trying to make sense of something. He's also trying to talk about horrific experiences sometime after the event, and that's one of the ways in which there's a parallel between Marlowe and Conrad. There are a lot of differences, too, but Conrad couldn't talk about these experiences in the Congo for years. He used other experiences in his fiction. There is actually a story called An Outpost of Progress two years earlier. He couldn't talk about them because he'd been too afflicted by them. Yes, yes, yes. I've I've talked to psychiatrists about this who've said, aha, what we've got here is some kind of post-traumatic stress, Mm -hmm. that reluctance Mm -hmm. to talk about what you've Mm -hmm. seen. And you've got an audience that isn't paying attention to some extent, Mm -hmm. except for that narrator. Mm -hmm. Can I come to Susan? Can you give us some... Can you flesh that out? I mean, uh, we've been taken by Lawrence here into something, into the, the heart of the book, in a way. Mm. What is he saying? What is Marlowe saying that is so terrible, as it were, for the reader and for Marlowe himself? Well, he... he can you just give us some examples, as it were, and from, from the reading that you, you put on it? Yes. Well, <clears throat> I think he's, what he's, he's trying to do is to put the onus of interpretation onto the reader to say... Um, this, you know, supreme moment of complete knowledge, which is what Marlowe calls um, Kurt, Kurtz's recognition of the horror, the horror, is something that is actually unnameable. It's as if he's... Uh, the horror of the situation, you have to talk The talk horror about. of the situation. The, situa- this is the, the situation the, of the whole thing, yeah. Of the whole thing, yeah. of the fact that Kurtz has given in to his desires, his earthly, material desires to... Um, you know, to, to subjugate the natives and to to gain a lot of ivory. You know, for he started off gain. as a civilizing force. He started off, and he was very much. You know, he all all Europe went to make up Kurtz. Said uh, Marlowe that he was a highly civilized character, and in fact, at the end of the novella, um, it, it's suggested that he was a, he might have been a musician. He was very gifted. He is simply a voice by the end of the of the novel, that his body actually disintegrates. So this moment of, you know, supreme knowledge that he actually gains is the nothing, is, the sum, is, is looking into the abyss and going in there, whereas Marlowe says that he looked into the abyss but stepped back and his narrative trails off into inconclusive dots at the end. Uh, and then... Um, the great point that the frame narrator makes there is to show that the men sitting on the boat, you know, look around and they're looking into the heart of an immense darkness, the Thames, mm. towards London. Mm. So there is, in fact, uh, an implication of uh, you know, British colonialism there, I think. The darkness of the centre of empire. Is Absolutely. About that, yeah. But I just want to nag away at this, Rob mm. Hampson. Um, he, 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 he published in a largely pro-colonial magazine, yeah. and yet he's saying very, very <laughs> unsympathetic things yeah. about white men, not necessarily British, yes. um, yeah. in fact, whatever they are, mm-hmm. but he's very, very unsympathetic about the way they are, yeah. their morality, uh, as, as, as Susan's mentioned, the greed and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Again, I'd like to get closer to it. What's he saying yeah. that would have yeah. been so disturbing in 1900? Right. I think part of what's going on there are certain kinds of reader trap as well. And there's two different kinds of reader trap. One is that... Reader uh, trap? Yes. Right, can you just uh, open that up a bit? Right. There's ways in which he sets traps for his reader, and there's two different traps he sets. One trap is where um, 
he makes statements, or Marlow makes statements, which are uncomfortable. So, for example, this also has been one of the dark places of the earth. Or when he talks about um, himself having a civilizing mission to intrude on the homes of his audience. So that there are words which are used, which kind of resonate awkwardly for the, for the conservative reader. Um, and the other kind of trap is where he deliberately misleads rather than just creates an uncertainty or doubt. So, for example, when he, he talks about the, the Romans in Britain, uh, that comes comfortably, uncomfortably close to home and, in a way, c- contains already in miniature the entire story about what's going on in the Congo in terms of both the, the treatment of the local people but also in terms of uh, the exploitation and also in terms of the way in which languages and things are projected onto the local people. So when he talks about savagery and the savages are in the Thames Valley, that's kind of awkward for the audience, for the readership. But the trap, for example, is he then talks about how British imperialism is different from Roman imperialism. He kind of backs away from the, the comparison and says, we are more efficient, we will be more efficient. And then he then defines colonialism in terms of aggravated murder, so that efficiency becomes problematic in that context. And then he kind of reassures again by saying what, what's important is the redeeming idea, and then trails off, and we think there's going to be some redeeming idea in the story he, to- he tells, but he stops after saying, so to set up and bow down before, so the story's actually about the opposite. Just for thanks, I'll come back a moment, and I just want to get to Kurtz, because we're, we're going to wait as long to get to Kurtz as Conrad does in his book. <laughs> <laughs> and Kurtz comes towards the very, very end. He's mentioned quite a few times, but the, the appearance of Kurtz and the presence, the mm-hmm. active presence of Kurtz is towards the very end of yes. the novel, isn't it? Um, now, I've said, perhaps mm-hmm. too, um, um, too, uh, you know, too briefly, really, that he was... It, He's, can you just tell us about what you think was the most important thing about Kurtz? And w- first of all, why did Conrad keep him so far? Why does it take so long to get to Kurtz? Because he wants to show Kurtz waking, working away on Mahler's imagination, yeah. imagining that voice, discoursing. There's a tremendous irony here because what, what will impress Mahler most of the famous words, the horror, the horror, and he's imagined before that some kind of lofty discourse. It's presented earlier on in terms of the report to the Society for the Suppression of Savage Customs, which uses this lofty vocabulary very much like the sort of thing you could see That's in many... Kurtz's paper, so-called yes, paper. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you can see a lot of that sort of thing in, in the British press of the time. And uh, Marlowe says, he, he took me with me, he soared. There's a tremendous irony there, because clearly he's, he's going off into the incomprehensible, the grand abstractions. But the one illuminating thing is the post-scriptum, exterminate all the brutes. So, so Kurtz has written a 17-page document, very, yes. very high-minded, mm-hmm. about yes. how to treat the people that one encounters in, yes. let's call mm-hmm. it the Congo, because it yes. was. Uh, and then at some stage later, he's yes. called Exterminate the Brutes. Yes. Yes. So this, yes. if one anything, yes. represents the massive change in Kurtz. Yes. Now, yes. let's get to the heart of the change. Right. OK. I, and then I know and, Susan wants to come in on this, th- but, but can great, you just lead us into this? There's a great dis- deal of discussion going on in the late 19th century about whether it's possible for evolution to go backwards. To, for people to degenerate. And Marlowe actually sees Kurtz trying to crawl towards the forest. Literally, right. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. It also turns out that Kurtz's unusual methods have extended beyond the usual brutality of whipping and hanging and hand chopping and so on that was going on in the Congo um, in going so far as to preside over certain rights, in other words, to try to deify himself... And he's become extraordinarily obsessed with possession. My ivory, my intended. Yes, the basis of his wealth is a collection of ivory and, yes. and of his yes. fame, the fact that he can collect more ivory than anybody else. Right. And so, and so. Yes. 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 So there's this tremendous grandeur uh, and, and, over, uh, and, and huge opinion of himself, this greed. He's hollow. He's trying to fill himself up. There's that motif running through the yeah. book of yeah. internal emptiness. We've said two or three times, um, but I'm not particularly counting Susan Jones, uh, that the, the, these, these most famous lines in this book are the horror, the horror. Mm. Can you take us to those lines? Do you just say how we get to those lines and why they're so powerful and why... I mean, they're powerful lines anyway, but still why they're so key and memorable in the book? I think, I think partly because Conrad is, is not writing a strictly realist story it the story is so is metafictional in a way and that it th- those words are so powerful because they remind us of all those european stories we already know the dantian 
story of moving towards hell, the uh, you know, the inferno. They they remind us of the Faustian overreaching. You know, I mean the the moment of the horror. The horror is is very like um, Marlowe's last uh, Marlowe's Faust's last speech. You know, yet one bare hour. Um, uh, I am in hell, nor am I out of it. This is hell, sorry. This is hell, nor am I out of it. So it's the horror, I think, that, that partly the Conrad is taking us through a kind of a reading lesson, you know, in, in understanding those things that we already know about. What do you think the horror, what do you think Kurtz do meant th- when he said the horror, the horror? <laughs> there has been much discussion, not least in the three papers I've had from you three, but, <laughs> uh, and my own thing. What, so what horror is he talking, the horror of what? <clears throat> I mean, one can fill in all sorts of it, but obviously you you spend a lifetime to think. <laughs> what do you think it means? I think it means it's, it's the horror of the bathos that actually comes out of, that, that, um, that is generated by um, too much power, by overreaching. Do you agree, Robert? <laughs> No. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think what's important is what you're saying, is that the horror, the horror is open to interpretation by the reader. In a sense, there's a moment in Tarkovsky's film, um, Solaris, where the camera moves over the shoulder of one of the characters as he's contemplating the, the, the most horrific thing, and the screen goes black. Mm. And at that moment, you project, everything, you project your deepest fear onto that blackness, onto that blankness. And that's what happens here, I think, with the horror of the horror. But what's important is that it's a moral statement whatever it means, which is the difference then from the manager saying it's an unsound method of trade. And that, those different discourses, I think, are very important as part of the conclusion. There's a great deal about eloquence in this oh, story. Yeah. Kurtz is famous for his eloquence. Marlowe the is voice, notorious, uh, yes, uh, yeah. for his own adjectival insistence, as one critic's called it. And yet the most eloquent moment is this succinct, the horror, the horror, which you can take as everything from the reaction of a man who's facing death and who sees his career as a sham, right through to a horror of being in a vast universe where it's very hard to find any meaning. There's a great emphasis on scale in this work, on the time scale and the geographical scale. No, I I mean, but surely that is, in a way, it is a kind... I mean, it... It's a gesturing towards mm-hmm. a grand tragic ending, yes. but it is. But it is yeah. pathetic. I mean, to mm-hmm. go back yes, to yes, my no, point, absolutely. Yes, yes, but it, yes. it, it comes yes. back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it draws mm-hmm. you into the, the the awful thing about the horror is that it is so real mm-hmm. that we understand mm-hmm. what the possibility, the yeah. potential yeah. of overreaching in that in that way. Um, the, this commuting. Mm-hmm of well, the word of God for the horror. But doesn't he mean the horror of himself? There he was, a man of civilization, mm. could have been a great musician, we're told, could have, was very eloquent, mm. could have been all sorts of... had all sorts of principalities of mm. intellect in the mm. Western world, goes there mm. and becomes a savage tribal chieftain gob. I use, God, I use tribal not in an African mm. sense, but in, mm. in an even older anthropological mm. sense, mm. to be worshipped, to mm. be in command, to mm. terrify thousands of people to do his will, and the horror of what he has become. Exactly. It's as simple as that. It's not as simple as that, but that's sort of basic. It, on one level, it is very simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on, on another level, it, is, you know, it opens out to endless interpretations. Yeah. And yeah. We, we've got time for a few of those interpretations. Let's start with an interpretation by Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian writer, who, was accused, um, uh, who accused Conrad of arrogance in reducing Africa to a prop for a, uh, the degeneration of a degenerate European. What do you, what's your response to that, uh, Robert Hampson? Right. Um, Achebe is both right and wrong. Um, I think what's important is the context in which he says that, and the context is um, 1970s Amer- America, um, the Conrad's Heart of Darkness is a standard text on all modern literature courses, but the way in which it's taught is as a psychological work. It's taught precisely, as he says, as a novel about the breakdown of a European. What's left out entirely in the interpretations in that period is Africa. Mm-hmm. And so Achebe is very important for bringing Africa back, reminding us this, although Conrad is ambiguous about where it's set, that nevertheless, there is an African hi- history that has to be put, mm-hmm. put back in. Where he's wrong, though, I think, is where he refuses to see there's a distance between Marlowe and Conrad, that Lawrence has already referred to ways in which Marlowe is and is not Conrad. And the ways in which he's not Conrad, I think, sets up the discourse that Marlowe produces in the context of the novel for our 
criticism. So that Marlowe used the kind of language that would be used by an Englishman who is complicit with with that colonial enterprise, which is what he has been, speaking to other people whose past is one of complicity with with colonialism. So putting it in a different way, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, yeah. please excuse my uh, simplicity. It, it's to say, look, what Marlowe is is a fictional character and the yes. views of Marlowe are not the views of Conrad. Exactly. And yeah. Marlowe is allowed to be a fictional uh, Aberrant. He can lie to be what he is because yeah. he's a fit, whatever the, the writer wants him to be. Yeah. And to say, oh, this is therefore the writer, this is therefore the book, is just it is not. No. It doesn't take you very far. No. And in, in contemporary terms, Conrad, in terms of the 1890s, Conrad was not a racist in those terms because he he believed not that there were separate races, but that he believed there was a common humanity. And he insists over and over again, even in Heart of Darkness, that there's a common humanity. It's surprising how widespread it still was massive. I mean, even the Fabian socialist Shaw, uh, yeah. when the Brits went to Chinese, talked yes. about the, Br- the English as a superior uh, race or yes, power. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. deeply bad. Yeah. Lawrence, do you want to talk about the reaction to it? And if you take us through one or two reactions from the time. One very important early reaction is that there's a campaign going on to tackle the Belgians, the Congo Reform Association led by Roger Casement, whom Conrad had met in the Congo, and by E.D. Morrell. And they actually found Heart of Darkness very valuable in illustrating what they were doing. Uh, the first rumblings of discontent over the Congo come early. An outpost of progress appeared in a magazine that had also published a very long critique by Sir Charles Dilk of Belgian uh, work. But there were, from quite early on, that anti-imperialist agenda, or anti-Belgian agenda at least, was picked up. But you also get the more lurid ones. The poet Arthur Simmons, for example, talks about Heart of Darkness in terms of savage rites and lurid scenes by torchlight and drumming and so on and so on. And lots of other people didn't know what to make of it. Conrad had a dilemma here. He came out of a world of political intrigue and suffering and cruelty that was very hard to imagine in Britain easier to imagine in Ireland, in, in Ireland, I think. And so it's very clear that even a lot of Conrad's friends, people like John Galsworthy, had a great deal of difficulty understanding what Conrad was talking about. And then there's a long period, as Robert was saying, of interpreting the book um, entirely without the African backdrop as a matter of ethical choices in the British tradition or as a matter of psychological or metaphysical questing mm-hmm. in an American tradition. And then there's a turn back and a, a, a renewed awareness that, yes, this has a political context. It's not the whole mm. book, but it's an enormously important part of it. What legacy would you like to bring to bear at this point in the conversation? Well, I, w- I was going to follow on from Lawrence's point there, that, uh, that actually what Conrad does in that novella is to play with all these contemporary tropes. Mm. I think a very good example of that is his representation of Kutz's mistress, the black woman, mm who in in many ways looks like um, a very typical um, reading of the, the savage or the or the um, the native in Africa where you will have seen um, illustrations of this kind of thing um, Sir Richard Burton's anthropological writings on Dahomey for example is uh, talking about the Amazon dances there which reminds one very much of the, the the black woman's uh, movement there. But the, the thing that Conrad does, that is he puts a sceptical turn on this by giving her a kind of integrity where she stops and she engages. She's walking along the bank. She's striding along the bank at, um, at the central station just before um, Marlowe meets Kurtz. And she um, thrusts her arms in the air, a kind of transcendent gesture, and she engages with her eyes the gaze of the men on the boat. There's no, there's no explanation there. There's something beyond language. He's, uh, it seems to me that the legacy of Conrad's novella there is to uh, delineate the failure of language. That comes, that comes through inside the book itself. He talks yes. about it being a dream, the whole thing being a mm-hmm. dream, subjective. We live as we dream alone. We dream and learn. Yeah. Robert, you wanted to come I was going to say, another issue, though, though, is that Marlowe can't communicate with the African woman. He doesn't speak the African mm-hmm. language. There's a very different impression of her that's given by the Harlequin, who can speak the, the local language, who talks about having an argument with her about clothing, about cloth, material. Mm-hmm. And the little story he tells gives a very different impression of this woman. Exactly. Marlowe has to pre- present her iconically, because um, he can't talk to her. He has no, he has no language. 
And yet he is acknowledging that she does have a history and a language. We, everybody, really, everybody listening will know about Apocalypse Now and the influence that mm. The Heart of Darkness had on, on, on the making of that, the mm. genesis of that film. Is that it, it's most, the most obvious uh, legacy in terms of a work, Lawrence, or are there others you would refer to? There are lots of works that turn in some way on Conrad. There are novels by Googie Wathiongo, for example, which very much reflect Googie's reading of Conrad and Wilson Harris from, um, from, from the Caribbean, from Guyana. There are lots of reworkings of Conrad. Graham Greene would be another mm-hmm. example of that. So there's that presence. There's the journalistic presence. It's, it's noticeable how often journalists talking about Africa... Uh, turn to that phrase as a summing up. And it's, of course, a, a, a quarter of a sixteenth of um, questions about African traditions, politics, a whole continent, enormous complexity. But people are always falling back on that phrase, the heart of darkness. Mm-hmm. And on those images of... Well, they dropped a definite article, didn't they? Well, yes, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And, and it makes it more mobile. Mm. in some ways. Mm. The other thing is the legacy of thinking about Kurtz, and there's a huge range from people like Lionel Trilling who saw Kurtz as a genius and takes literally what I think is a very ironic m- remark of, of Mahler's about Kurtz being a remarkable man, right through to the interpretations that say, no, he's not a great talent monkey. He's a jack of all trades. He could have been a journalist, a politician on the popular side. Conrad loathed popular journalism. The tabloid press was just starting. Well, it was actually read it broad- out, really. yeah, it was bro- it was broadsheet in form at the time, but it was just starting promoting in England and America and in France mm. and Germany um, a very aggressive mm. form of colonialism. Kurtz is a fraud in many ways, and he's banal. Mm. One of the extraordinary things about this work is that it makes a banal figure like Kurtz into somebody memorable. You're going to have to be brief. It's also important that he is an idealist and that that what you see is the man who has ideals, which then reveal within themselves, the break open to reveal the will to power that that desire to do good has Mm. inside it. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Robert Hampson, Lawrence Davis and Susan Jones. That was fascinating. Next week on In Our Time, well, it's unique, actually. We're going out the studio up to uh, the birthplace of William Wilberforce to look at that radical, world-changing figure, that remarkable man. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.